Welcome to Positive Filter with your host, Fuller Wilkerson, a podcast that focuses on friends, family, health, and career with a little self-help along the way. Please join me in this journey for self-improvement, and I hope what I have to share will make you a better person, thus making the world a better place. I hope you enjoy the show. I hope you enjoy the show. I hope you enjoy the show. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, it's Philip Wilkerson back with another episode of Positive Filter. I'm joined by a special guest. Everyone is a special guest, but I'm joined by a throwback. Um, and this is just a really special episode. I'm joined by one of my old professors, not old as in uh, his age, but old as in uh, back in the day. And so I'm joined by Professor H. Galfan. Now, uh, you know, I don't really, it's not really a surprise. Uh, you know, I tell all the students uh, I was a history major and I think I'm gonna give this guy a lot of shout out before I even ask him questions. But I remember being a student at James Madison University, studying business and felt like just one of many a number. And I took one class, a gen ed history class uh, with this wonderful professor. And I was like, man, this dude's woke. <laughs> I didn't, we didn't use that term back then, but I was thinking like, wow, this guy's really insightful. Uh, I love how he teaches history. And I remember just going back, and I was like, you know what? I'm not feeling this business major. I want to be a history major. And uh, just the way that you, you taught made me have a passion for it. And I, I tell a lot of people, like, I had no plans of what I was going to do with that degree. But I knew that if I was going to study something, I wanted to study something where I was engaged, something where I was in a classroom and got to talk because I like to talk. And I just really enjoyed the process. And I, I give you a lot of kudos, a lot of shout outs for just getting me involved in history and come to find out my dad was a history major as well. And just, you know, in life, what I teach at Career Center is that like, I kind of use my degree in other ways, but uh, it was just good to have that, uh, that, that basis and, and the, the wonderful professors that I had, such as you and all my other history professors that I had in Jam- at JMU that made me really think I made the right choice by switching my major. But before I go into the episode and talking about what's going on, H, can you give a little bit of an intro about who you are? Well, first of all, thank you for that extremely generous <laughs> introduction. Yeah. Um, so I'm H. Gelland. I teach in the Interdisciplinary Studies Department at JMU. Uh, this is my 15th year that I'm teaching. I also teach in the Africa, African-American and Diaspora Studies Department in American Studies and also in Environmental Humanities. So... I teach kind of in a bunch of different places, which is one of the things which is terrific about the job. Uh, I got my PhD at the University of Arizona, and I was an undergraduate back at the University of Georgia, so uh, went to school at different places in the country. Grew up in the New York City area, so even though uh, it's, it's sort of funny to me because a lot of my research deals with California, so in spirit and mind, I oftentimes place myself However, in the, the sort of genetic way, I am definitely a New Yorker. It is <laughs> yeah. the place yeah. I'm at most of the time when I'm not at JMU, where my battery gets recharged and where my spirituality is kind of renewed in humanity. Uh, you know, it's, it, one of the things I love about New York is pretty much anything and everything you can find there. People from around the world, people from around the world, languages from around the world, you know, th- you are missing out on a lot of the beauty that say like Los Angeles offers. I don't know, Philip, if you've been to Los Angeles, which is straight. (laughs) It's okay. (laughs) I mean, you know, I ain't no shade to LA. I've been to LA, but you know, I I think my vibe is more the Bay. I've been to the Bay in Cali. I like that place a little bit more. Well, San Francisco is the, the whole Bay area is hands down of the, the urban centers, the most beautiful that we have. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Nothing like it. It's, it's got its own, light its own feeling its own spirit there is a relaxed nature about much of what goes on there that we lack on the east coast uh which is interesting but i think that's where that that visual stimulus of the mountains and the beauty that they really have an impact in a way that on the east coast we don't if you think about most of our east coast cities you know i'll I'll pick on new york boston philadelphia dc we're all kind of gray, honestly, and brown. You know, there was so much development so early on that there wasn't really much foresight into making the places nice. And because the geography isn't necessarily that stunning, 
I think that we all tend to be kind of stressed out. You know, it, it's why we focus on parks. Whereas if you're out on a lot of the cities on the West Coast, you just, I mean, like, if you were in Seattle and you look out the window and you're staring at the largest volcano on the mainland United States, it, it connects, it, it's a way of, of really bringing you inner peace, I think. So I, I do think after having lived so long as I did in the West, that that's part of the reason why people are more relaxed in that part of the country. It's because you don't have to go to temple or church to get your spirituality. You just look out the window and it's sitting there. Yeah. Well, they can't see you, but uh, I swear to, I swear uh, uh, H has found the fountain of youth. Uh, I remember when I was uh, in class as an undergrad, I thought this, I thought he was like an older brother age, and, and we had a significant age gap. He, he's very youthful uh, and appearance riding, riding the longboard on campus. Um, but kind of jumping into our topic, you know, one of the things I've always thought about and I appreciate about you, whether just on social media or just in general, is that you have a very analytical approach to looking at current events, but then you do a lot of the back research. Um, kind of just going that, back to that love of history, do you, do you always kind of look at that lens like, yo, what's really going on right now? And then you kind of trace it back. Like, how do you like, how do you consume like current media or news and then kind of start looking at it from uh, more of a historical lens? It's, it's a tough one because uh, I, I will, I guess before we go any further, I should probably demonstrate my disdain and dislike of the current presidential administration. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's all good. Yeah, we know. <laughs> so, uh, so, so for me, it's, it's actually been very difficult these last three and a half years because on one hand, in order to be a good teacher in the classroom or now online, I have to be aware of all of what is going on. Mm -hmm. I have to have a good working knowledge so that when students ask me questions that I'm in a position to answer those questions. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also very difficult not to be incredibly emotional reading day-to-day -day stories. Uh, I'll, I'll just give you one example of one of the things which has been incredibly difficult is all of this imprisonment of people who are trying to get to the United States mm -hmm or job purposes and the separation of their children and the way that people are treated, which is simply inhumane. And we are all party to it as taxpayers. Uh, I'll give you another example, which has been very trying for me because I used to live in Portland is watching, now it's just the city police, but it had been federal troops for much of the summer out uh, on the street, preventing people who are simply demonstrating their disdain for current politicians. You know, it's, it's striking to me that we can be very patriotic at football and baseball games, and we can sing the words to our national anthem, and we can claim all these things that we enjoy about America, like freedom. And then when people who disagree with us display that freedom, we have such visceral reactions now. Mm -hmm. If we're thinking about it, how far have we progressed or not? Mm -hmm. We have neo-Nazis and white supremacists rallying in the streets of our cities mm -hmm. and the president of the United States doesn't in any way demonstrate any frustration, anger, or disappointment. Mm -hmm. And says instead, well, there's good people on each side. Mm -hmm. So this is all... I will just say on an emotional level, very, very difficult. When I put my historian's cap on, mm -hmm. this makes a lot of sense. Because I, I'll, I'll give you an example. So, uh, and, and maybe this is not a fair comparison, but I'll just give the comparison. Germany. Germany, which had an experience in the 1930s and 40s in which it was incredibly cruel and murdered millions of people who were Jews. And after the war, it took decades for there to be a fair reconciliation, primarily by the children and the grandchildren of the people who were the leaders of the Holocaust, to say, my goodness, that was not a good thing what my father or grandfather was involved in. So now when you go to Germany in the present day, every German school child is forced to visit death camps. They are forced to go to all of these sites where Hitler made speeches, they are forced to read monuments, plaques about where people were sent to their deaths, about where people mm. were. In other words, it's 
physically impossible in Germany in the present day not to be completely aware of the Holocaust. So that the entire country culturally, spiritually, has had to deal with that lack of morality. Right. So yeah. they, they address it. So like basically what we're saying is they use history. They use history and embedded it into, when I say rec reckless, uh, reckless, uh, oh my gosh, I can't get the word, but they embedded it into, uh, you know, not say reparations, but like uh, forgiveness or whatever. Reconciliation, there it is. That's the word. Um, they embedded that where they was like, this is a mirror of what we were, were as Germany. And there's no way to say we weren't like this. That'd be similar to, in my understanding, like, we're going to go to the church that was bombed and, you know, a church that was bombed in Alabama. And we're going to go to the grounds and see that. Like, there's no way to say, oh, that's so far away ago. Like, we, uh, we, they, they use history as a tool to say, we need to address this and, and, and face it. And there's no denial phase. Uh, right. And I don't think in certain cultures, I think that one of the things I've always appreciated about you and the way you taught history was that like people would get triggered. I guess I would remember people would get triggered in class, but you're saying like, I'm not saying this is you in the present moment, but you have to recognize and fully look at historically what we have done to actually work to a better future. And like, there's no like all like, you know, that guilt part, like, Oh, I don't want to think about it. I don't want to talk about it. But it's like, no, you need to have these full discussions and readings and all these things about it. Not to say put guilt on you and say, oh, you know, you are this person, but also know the historical context about things. Look, it's, it's an important consideration that we as a country have never faced up to collectively all of the failings of our society. Mm -hmm. And slavery being one of the large ones what we did to the indigenous populations of North America being the other large one. We have done a little bit better job of dealing with Japanese American incarceration during World War II. I say a little bit better in the fact that we generally use that as an example to say, okay, here's where we failed and look, we paid these people some money, but are we ever really embracing any of these in the same way that Germany is doing. And I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, you, you probably remember that I spent a couple of years living in Annapolis when I was doing research on the Naval Academy. Mm -hmm. One of the very prominent landmarks in the downtown of Annapolis, which is this very big tourist center, is this very low hipped roof, one story building at the end of the city dock, which now has a fast food restaurant. And that was the slave market, mm. which hundreds of thousands of Africans Mm -hmm. were unloaded off of ships. There's no sign, there's no discussion, there's no collective knowledge, except for the very few black people who live in Annapolis who I asked about it. No one in that entire city even knew what that building was. Mm. This is the, what, what I guess I'm coming to realize is what you see manifesting now with George Floyd, with Black Lives Matter, with a lot of the protests going on in America, neo-Nazis, is we've never really fully reconciled with the failures of our own country. Mm -hmm. And until you do that, and I'm not trying to get all Alcoholics Anonymous here, but until you really admit the problems, yeah. you never move forward in resolving some of those problems. And, 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 you, and you made a good point. You said there's, and, and, and from your historical lens, you said there was, there's examples of doing it in other countries that you've seen. You said it in Germany. Um, and then, like, I think there's a balance. Like, one of the things I always thought about, like, is that when you talk about the failings of America, that means that you're, like, you don't like America. I, I always hate it when someone says, like, if you don't like how good it is here, then why don't you leave? And I was like, but why can't you have a criticism of the environment you're in, a healthy dialogue, talk about what you want to do to move forward um, without saying that you hate the place that you're at, you know, like – you can do that. I mean, people do that in marriages. You know, you talk about your problems in a marriage and then you address them and you try to work toward it. Like, I don't I've never understood the, the concept of if you address something that's wrong, that means you inherently don't like it. Right. Look, one, one of the you know, founding fathers of our country, Thomas Jefferson, a slave owner, it wrote a, a letter. Part of the letter is inscribed inside of the memorial in D.C. And he says, and I'm paraphrasing, you can't expect... Uh, an old man to still wear 
the coat that he wore when he was a boy. And this was a discussion about why you were making the Constitution so malleable. Because even the people that made the country understood that over time it was going to change. And if you look at the history of our country, it has largely been a history, a very slow history of that, of giving people rights and having people achieve some degree of equality. Are we there yet? Heck no. I think we all understand that we have a very long way to go toward that. But if you look at, and this is one of the things which is very interesting about the whole discussion of voting right now, how long did it take all of the groups of people who are now hypothetically allowed to vote to get that right to vote? Yeah, yeah. And so, so we are on always... I hope, a quest of improving. I think this is one of the things which has been very disappointing about the Trump administration is because in three, four years, how much of that progress has been undone. Mm -hmm. and, and that's not helpful. You know, when, when you live in a country and you are like me, where you attempt to be optimistic every day and think that we are always on this upward trajectory in terms of becoming better, but then we have this moment where we're faltering. And part of the question to ask, and this is gonna be a question which many future historians will be dealing with. I will be long since dead by the time. <laughs> yeah. How did we end up with Donald Trump? And what does that reveal about our society? Now I can make some suggestions about that. And I would say a very large part of that had to do with the frustration that a lot of people had with having an a black president for eight years, or as I'd like to call him, a Hawaiian president for eight years. <laughs> well, there were a lot of people that had a big problem with that. Um, and maybe there is some, some reactionary aspect of that. One can discuss whether or not the candidate the last time around on the Democratic side was the right candidate. I mean, there are untold numbers of reasons. But the fact that we have this person in office and the fact that we have members of his own party who if any other person were in charge, they would be reacting negatively and they sit with their mouth shut. Yeah. Very bizarre. It, 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 I mean, it's going to be, it's going to be a whole chapter in some book, like a whole chapter would be his presidency or a whole chapter would be dedicated to 2020 alone. I feel like, I feel like as you can see, we're right. Like we're living in history. I, I hate to say that, but like, you know, I, I was talking to someone the other day about how like, you know, you glimpse and you look up and all the things that you thought were super, super significant events, you, you can still remember and living through them, you know, 9-11, right. or like, I can remember, like, I can close my eyes and remember what, what classroom I was in when the building, you know, the planes hit, like, but like, I don't know, I mean, there's no like one event, I feel like this whole year, 2020, is going to be definitely dissected, <laughs> like, it's something, you know, and I agree with you, I think that not only would this individual year be dissected, but I think the past four years from uh, 2016 to now is going to be a full study, too, of some kind of intertwining of how social media and just messaging and news. Like, it's going to be a whole historical thing, a whole yeah. historical phenomenon. I, I think in, in so many ways, the, the, the key event this year was Kobe death, Kobe's death. Um, you know, unexpected and somebody who had apparently been going down some paths that were not too great, but managed to, to switch his life around to figure out his significance as both a family member and a public figure and had invested his life in doing a lot of good things for other people. And when that guy just disappears in the snap of a finger, that, that in so many ways is representative of many things, other things that have happened this year. The unexpected, the, you see somebody in the process of trying to do better and they get taken down. Mm -hmm. you know, black man having this happen to you. It's, it's all just very, very interesting. Yeah. Now, one of the things I, I know, and, and we're talking about, you know, this is not the first instinct of, uh, of America dealing with a, uh, a national or global pandemic, right? Uh, uh, what's going on. I remember, and I, I just still in my head remember you saying flat out, like, I do not like the phrase, history repeats itself. Um, but <laughs> we've seen global patterns, uh, you know, people that are like really into patterns. Like, what, why, why was that one of the phrases that you're not a fan of? Well, okay, so, so let me say, 
I mean that on a meta level. Yeah. I look at that on an individual basis. I would say, yeah. And I say that, and I'll just be frank with you, because of how many friends I've had who have gone through rehab multiple times. Yeah, yeah. Well, on yeah. individual levels, don't often change their behavior. So, okay, that given. But, you know, I, I grew up with a lot of people saying things like, oh, you know, compare the assassinations of Abraham Lincoln and John F. Kennedy, and here's all the things that they haven't got. Their last names have seven letters. And <laughs> like, yeah, sure. That's not true. But yeah, that's what great. I think is, is bothersome about that is the circumstances that create particular moments are never the same. And so comparing one event to another event is really false in that sense, in that what led to them is really quite different. You know, it used to be, if, if you go back to probably when you were in high school, you will probably remember this, where people were comparing the war in Iraq with the war in Vietnam. Yeah, yeah, like pull them out and we're not doing so well and all that stuff, yeah. Other than the general rubric of American imperialism, they mm -hmm. had nothing to do with each other. The causes of them, the people behind them, the goal mm -hmm. them were all completely different. Right. This is, I think, the, the reason why I tend not to like that that concept of history repeating itself is because, look, things happen as we know. And what led to them happening is never the same. The people that caused them to happen are never the same. So it, I prefer to look at them all each as individual cases and really try to figure out more in terms of the analysis of what led to those particular circumstances happening rather than saying, oh, Here's something that's repeating itself. There are certain things that I think that we can understand are cyclical. If I'm an economist, I can see, yes, the economy is mm -hmm. like a travel. It goes up and down, right? Mm -hmm. in, in politics, yes, there are things which are somewhat repetitive in politics about parties adopt certain leanings or whatever. But I think that, that it's better to just ask, what led to these things happening and how do we figure out how to curtail the behaviors mm. and the negatives from happening again? And how do we look at their good things and figure out, okay, how do we make the good things happen more often? Yeah, and I like that. Mm -hmm. example of, of the good. If you go back to World War II, the year is 1944, everyone is understanding that the United States is leaning in the direction of defeating both Germany and Japan. And some economists come to Franklin Roosevelt, the president at the time, and say, we're going to get millions of people who come back from the war looking for a job. And we just got the Great Depression done by building all these planes and air, uh, all of this machinery to, to operate the war. What are we going to do? And Roosevelt turns it around and says to these economists, what are we going to do? And therein is born the GI Bill of Rights which is this piece of legislation that gives free college education to all of those who served in uniform. As many degrees as they wanna get, whatever topics they wanna to do, and it not only pays for the tuition, but the books, the room and board, their insurance, all these things. And if you look at the couple of decades after World War II, this is the greatest expansion of the American economy that has ever happened. And you have to ask why? Well, because Look at where higher education was before World War II. Who were the people that went to college? They were fairly wealthy white people. Yeah. And that's not across the board, but you did not see a whole lot of people who were not white going to college. You did not see a whole lot of people who were either from farming backgrounds or middle class even going to college. When you take all of these people and you give them that opportunity to learn, and then you look at what they did with that opportunity, and this runs the whole gamut from Hugh Hefner coming with Playboy. He went to college on the GI Bill all the way up to the people that figured out how to do like Hewitt, Hewlett and Packard, the guys who figured out some of the basics of computers. These are all people that really never would have gone to college without that. So in other words, the country makes this investment in education. Mm -hmm. And what happens? You find out that a heck of a lot of people are super smart out there in our country. And if you give them the basics of education, that's what we would call in an economic sense, a multiplier effect, right? 
you give an investment in somebody's brain and then look at what they create. So that's one of the things where I would say is a really good example that we should be following now. And if you look at where we are with COVID now and where higher education is Mm -hmm. at this moment of having to do things in a totally different way. And I'll use the word structurally different because it may turn out that on the tail end of the COVID epidemic, whenever that is, we may find that we don't need the bricks and the mortars of a physical campus to do things. Mm -hmm. Because if we are figuring out right now, for example, that professors can adapt to teaching online and convey that information and convey that inspiration online the way that they did in the classroom, we may not even need the physical classroom. So if I'm going to start teaching online and that can become available to whoever out there in the, the universe of the interwebs wants to get that information, isn't that a good thing then? Of course, I'm undermining my own occupation when I say that. <laughs> yeah, yeah but, and, and we also know that like, I mean, we could, we could definitely go completely uh, virtual, but there, there's other parts of the experience, the hired experience that is lenient to brick and mortar. And you know, like, I, I'd, I'd be totally transparent. I love you, I think you're a great guy. But if I just had you online, I get to see you, I think it changes my experience, you know, like, I think one of the things that was really a selling point of my experience in history was taking a class with you in person right? Um, and having that in-person dialogue and not necessarily just read this and come back later. It was like the spontaneity of where the discussion goes with in-person discussions. You know, I love that part. That's how I learned, you know, like it was more like read a little bit so you can come to class ready to talk, but I learned in the classroom as well. So I don't know. I think you're right. Like it's going to change the mold, but you know, I think there is, it's going to be a balance. You know, I think a balancing act. And I definitely agree with that. Uh, this summer, it was decided to release a film version of the musical called Hamilton. Now, Hamilton, people have been paying between 800 and 1500 a ticket. Mm-hmm. Now, that obviously meant that a large segment of the population was never going to see that musical, myself included. Mm-hmm. You put that thing on Disney Plus for whatever it is, $7 a month? Mm-hmm. How many people have now seen that musical? Right. So access to access changes a little bit. So, so there is a, a good encapsulated example of where the experiential has to be reconsidered, right? Mm-hmm. I will admit, as somebody who loves going to see plays and musicals on Broadway, yeah, there is something very magical and special about being in that physical space where you know mm-hmm. that you're going to absent yourself out of all the things around you, focus, mm-hmm. and have your world changed for a couple of hours. Mm-hmm. But when you take that experience and you send it out to the masses, how many people are out there singing the lyrics to these songs? How many people now know a little bit more about the origins of the financial system? How many people know more about the founding fathers and their flaws mm-hmm. than before? Because that musical is providing a vehicle for people to learn that would not have been accessible to the overwhelming majority of the American population who did not have $850 to spend on two hours. That makes sense. So, so what you just said is exactly correct. We have to figure out now in this virtual world, where is the balance mm-hmm. between you're in that physical space where the magic happens or you're in this new space that we're all, I think, better understanding because of Zoom that existed before. But really, how many of us ever really thought about the virtual in this sense before? Skype was the, the gateway, right? It was the stepping stone. That, that, that was like the, the candy cigarette into your Marlboro mood. Right? <laughs> yeah. Like we all had the experience of Skype and understood how great it was, but none of us had jobs or lives that revolved around Skype, at least not that no. I know. And now we're starting to understand how we can be connected. This is in some ways fulfilling the, the, the goals that Al Gore, you know, who claims to have created the, the internet, set out you know, 30 <laughs> years ago when he said this is going to connect everybody in the world in a way that had never been connected. And now here we are, really kind of connecting in a very interesting way. So it's, it's, 
the, the COVID is going to, I think, end up generating better books than the books about the Trump presidency. Yeah. COVID in the long run is what's going to have changed American society in a very substantial way. I agree. I agree. Now, what, 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 uh, and, 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 and there's a, one more question until we go to my, my next segment of the podcast. But the thing is, okay, so we kind of examine, and even if you said a medical physical way, that you don't study history, look at things from a historical lens to see overarching patterns. But you did say two things, like you look at it to see somewhat mistakes you made and maybe some successes and how to replicate. But from your understanding, like freshman 101, history 101, why would you encourage someone like me sit in a classroom to study history? Purpose wise, what's the purpose of this discipline in your mind? It's, it's important to understand the foundation on which everything is built. And it doesn't even matter if we're thinking about in an academic setting, it doesn't matter what other academic discipline you go into, mm-hmm. you're learning history. Right. Yeah. In mathematics, if you go back to when you were thinking about algebra, you learned the Pythagorean theorem, right? And yeah, so I think I said, yeah, yeah. Pythagoras, right? And you learned yeah. that Arabs had their own counting system, and here's why we have Roman numerals and Arabic numerals. If you go into any science classroom in the world, the periodic table of the elements is up on the walls. What is that? It's a historical document. Right? <laughs> the first two elements that were discovered helium and hydrogen are the ones at the top the ones that are the theoretical ones are the ones that are at the bottom so th- this is what i love about my own academic discipline is that it really is at the root of every other thought process yeah. and because it forces us to look back i think what it's doing for us is it's it's providing the guidance that we need to understand how we've gotten to where we are at the moment and take from that what you will and use that information as you will, but it does help to place us how we've gotten to the present moment in a way that no other academic discipline is going to do. I love that. You know, I was thinking about that in the back of my head. I was like, man, it is really influential. Like if you're a journalist, you got to know the behind the scenes story, like anything. Absolutely. And like, like, you know, origin stories. I love origin stories for comic books, you know, like, <laughs> You got to know how Superman became Superman. You got to do some history. You know, like, you know, it's great. You know, I, I think, you know, it, shout out to the history majors. Like, I mean, we're, we are, as like an octopus, have little legs that are a little bit in a lot of different disciplines. Absolutely. And I never thought about that. And that's, I never thought about it as a science way of math, because I ain't going to lie. Those were never my favorite subjects. <laughs> you know, were, like, <laughs> I'm trash at math. But I do like to know, like, rather than like actual, like, how to do the Pythagorean theorem. Like someone told me like, yo, this is how it started. Or this is what, like, take yourself back to ancient Greece. I find that way more fascinating. Right. Like the backstory. So that's pretty cool. And I haven't thought about that. It might, might influence some people to study history like us. And I, I also like would say curve too. It's like uh, from, I know I'm one of your students that reach out to you. I'm pretty sure you have many different students in different occupations in the world that studied history, but went different ways. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, may, you know, Philip, I have a lot of prize students. You're one of them. I, I, claim, I claim it. <laughs> I claim it. I claim it. That I, you know, th- there are some students, I'm just going to share an anecdote with you, who you just kind of know. Uh, I had a student who was a freshman when I was teaching at the University of Arizona and stayed after class one day. She was very clearly upset and I asked what was going on. And I knew that she was the daughter of immigrants. And I said, what's going on? And she said, you know that in our city in Tucson, which is a city of about a million people, there is no counseling or infrastructure to help immigrant women who were raped. And I was kind of surprised at that because it's a big immigrant community. And I said, okay, so what can be done about it? She said, well, that's what I wanted to ask you. And I said, well, Maybe, uh, you know, a good method of dealing with it is just to go to the city council or go to the mayor and just announce this to them. This is, student turns out to be, uh, I'll, I'll just fast forward before I tell you who it is. Just So one day, years later, I'm up early, I'm brushing my teeth, I'm listening to NPR as I normally do, and the guest on this particular program is this student. And I literally like 
fell over because I'm like, okay, this is the greatness of, of life is how you connect with people and how things happen. So this happens to be a, a woman named Opal Tometi, who's one of the three co-founders of the Black Lives Matter movement, who I was her freshman history teacher. I was her history advisor. I wrote all her letters for her graduate school. Oh my gosh. I, I claim no influence or anything over her because she is just brilliant on her own. But when you look back and know that somebody that you taught or encouraged along the way ends up creating a worldwide social movement. You can see now why when I tell you back uh, earlier in the spring when I was marching down Fifth Avenue in a Black Lives Matter protest, I was glad that I had a mask on because I was crying and sobbing my eyes out the whole time because not only because of just the emotionality of, of the moment, but because of this reconnection, the way that that loop got sealed about here she was all those years ago, a freshman in my class. And now here I am marching in a march that she prompted. This is one of the great joys of, of my profession. Jeez. No, I mean, that's, that gave me chills and also like almost got me watered up because I don't think, I think about that greater purpose was like, man, I know I might not be doing big things, but I might have that one student and I'm going to claim them. If I say that, like, I'm definitely going to claim them, just like you did those stories where it's like, yo, and, and I think that's the access part. That is the, the purpose part is like the influence that you have on people and letting them go out and do the things, you know, the things, whatever the things are. But just that when you are in their story or then in the chapter of their of their book, that you had a positive influence and, you know, you just help someone out. And, you, and you're right. You're right. You don't know where that's going to go. You, you don't know. You, you just in that moment say, I'm going to help this person. And it's it's crazy how that and that's the history thing right there. Like, that's what I love about history, too, is like all those like random interconnections that like if one person would have went left, but they, they you know, they went right how different their experience could have been, exactly. you know? Um, and I definitely love, I love those stories where I was like, man, this by happenstance, they had the same class together and they, 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 you know, they left the class and started a business and made billions of dollars. Like there's like instances like that, those stories like that, that I think history gets to, to, to reveal to people. So let's go to my last, my next portion of the show is called shot for shot. Uh, you get to ask me any random question. I get to ask you any random questions, not even related or not, whatever. You want to go first, I'll go first. All right. So one question I have for you is, how are you and your wife negotiating the current moment with your boys? As in like parenting? Yeah. And <laughs> like, all right, man, it's, it's whoever is not technically on the calendar working. Um, we're both working right now. Um, it's hard. Uh, you know, we have some supports. Um, I, I ain't gonna lie, the, the, the one part is like, there's really no off, you know, uh, we're on, on, on both of us. The, the, that's the hard part and it's stressful. And, and I think it's exacerbated a little bit of uh, any stresses, like whether you're a good parent or not. Oh my gosh, my kids on screens too long. You know, like, what am I, you know, but I can't, it's a lot. But on the, on the flip side is I think in this window of time, if I can go back and look at it, this is by the closest we've ever been as a family. And honestly, not having our kids go to separate daycares. There's a three year gap. I feel like we've some, we have solidified or cemented that they're going to have a closeness as brothers. Yeah. Um, because they're always around each other. They have no choice. Right. <laughs> like, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, and so looking at the silver lining in that is like, you know, they're not being sent to daycare and, 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 and Bennett would have been in kindergarten. They have to be around each other. So, um, it's hard. I think it's day to day, you know, uh, it's also, like you said, the negotiation is like, yo, I know you need this or that, you know, like go see your friends and, and stay out on their patio, social distance and, and have a drink with your friends. I got the kids tonight. You know, it's, it's, it's a lot of like flipping, flopping, you know, and, and giving people what they need. A keyword is what they need. You know, I'm a big extrovert. So giving me that space yeah. to, to be social, uh, but it's a lot of it. And, and, and it, it, it takes a lot of balance, like not make it, making sure it's not one-sided, you know? So um, I think that's like a normal, I think it's like normal marriage. It's like negotiation, but I feel like it's, it's negotiation times 10 when you're <laughs> stuck with each other all the time during COVID, but right. things right. like that. 
that, that lack of, of capacity to go out into public space the way that we've all been used to has really reshaped a lot of the ways that people are interacting with each other. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I've really done a lot more of these social. I ain't gonna lie, I miss physical. So I, I'll, I'll say, hey man, I'll come through and just stay on your, get a chair. I'll stay on your deck, you know what I'm saying? But I need to see you, you know, um, and see my friends, you know what I'm saying? Because um, I, I really miss that and vice versa for my wife. She's very, she has a good core friend, group of friends too. And she, I know she needs that, you know? Like, I know you're tired of seeing me. Go, go out, <laughs> like leave her. <laughs> like, but we both need that, you know what I'm saying? As long as we're, quote unquote, still safe, you feel me? So those are, that's the balance that we have. Yeah. All right, so my question for you is, um, uh, you are a person of color, right? Have you learned of your, your, your ancestral uh, heritage? Um, I believe Cuban, right? Am I, am I correct in saying Cuban culture? Correct. What is something during this time that you've done or I say during this time that you do to stay uh, connected to your Cuban roots. Um, I don't know, just something like music, food, whatever. What is something that you've done during COVID particularly to stay in, in, in touch with your, your roots? So uh, just uh, since no one other than you and I will know this, I only got this discovery. It's been about nine years now uh, after my mother died. And I discovered that I was adopted and then through the process of uh, DNA testing and a friend of mine who, a former student actually, who used to work at uh, Ancestry.com, finding out that I'm Latino. And it, it, it's been very interesting because it explains now why I have always loved Mexican food. It explains why when I lived in Arizona, I used to get pulled over by the Border Patrol all the time. You know, it, it, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, during this COVID time, I've spent a, actually a great deal of time listening to a fantastic radio program. It's called Latino USA, an NPR program. And it's really helped me to explore a lot of the connections, uh, not only to other Latino people and groups, but understanding what other people's experience is like that is either similar or dissimilar to mine. Uh, I'll just give you an example. I was just listening to an episode involving the, the term Latinx. Yeah. Or that's the right term or just Latino, Latina. And I have sort of taken on just the idea of using Latinx because I wanted to be on whatever the vanguard of that identity was. And then I'm finding out that, um, so there was a study that was done by the Pew Charitable Trust that only 7% of Latino people are using that term and the seven people happen to all be academics. And now I'm wondering if I should stop using that term to go back to being more democratic in the use of the terminology. So it's, it's been really interesting uh, contemplating a lot of that. So yeah, so that's, that's been really most of what I've been doing. I've been listening to a lot of music, reading a lot of Latino literature, mm -hmm. just trying to make sure that I'm sort of understanding my own past through that, that DNA connection, uh, given that growing up, I did not have any of that connection, obviously. So, yeah, it's been an interesting trip. And I, I, mean, I, I, I totally agree with that in a sense that, you know, I'm very, I, I don't claim to be an expert on blackness and, and, and obviously the black experience is not monolithic, but I made it an additional point to, you know, always still stay involved, read literature by black, by black people, uh, listen to podcasts. It, it, it's like, just because you have a certain identity and go about that doesn't make you an expert on it right. and that you're learning about it even within the culture. And like, you can't just be like, Oh, I'm black. That's, that's all I need to know. Like, no, you, if you express blackness, you need to also learn yourself. You need also need to learn and read and all those things. So I definitely during this time is still making a point to, to um, still educate myself um, and still read. And so I kind of agree with you. I listen to podcasts that are related to yeah. blackness and I listen to things uh, just to kind of continue to educate myself because I, I do essentially giving you shout outs about history is that I felt more affirmed. I feel more affirmed in my being in the present if I know who I was or, or my people were. Right. And, uh, you know, 
like last night, I mean, obviously this is going to come out a couple weeks later at this podcast, but I watched I'm Not Your Negro. Uh And just watching that documentary, I I don't know how it didn't dawn on me that uh, um, Martin Luther King and Malcolm X were only 39 years old when they were assassinated. And I was like, wow, like I never thought of that. It's like because I was watching that documentary at that moment, which is something I always learn something new about history. It reframed my 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 current perspective. Right. And the way it reframed my current perspective was, wow, these guys live immensely tremendous, impactful lives at the age of 39. You know, I'm 35. I was like, wow, like that's crazy. And so I think that learning and history, like it's still changes you still can apply that th- that thinking to your present thoughts and like wow look how impactful they were imagine how impactful they would be if they lived long like all those things and pack you unpack a lot and so i think that's i think that great that you're doing that uh, in your journey uh, about your identity and uh and i'm always i'm continuously doing that myself so it's pretty good. cool and it's it's really great also uh reading a lot of literature. I read a lot of literature, especially plays and, and poetry. Uh, they're always such strong reflections of the past, but it's also really great to know what people are doing now. I have, um, I, I'm not going to call this person a friend, but just somebody I interact with who works at a bookstore and she's kind of really, really on the up and up of everything that's cutting edge. And so she'll send me an email every couple of months and say, do you know about this poet or have you read this person's plays? And that's how I can connect to a lot of the, the really big cutting edge stuff because it's also great to be aware of what people are doing in the here and now. I really love that, you know. That's dope. Well, we had a wonderful episode. I feel like I was back in class again, learning some new things. I took some notes. I was like, dang, man, he's dropping gems on me again, always. Um, keep doing what you're doing. This is the part of the show called Shout Outs and Plugs. Uh, give a shout out to anyone you want to show love to. Uh, I don't know, anyone. And then plugs, anything if you are comfortable with uh, where the listeners can follow up with you. Or if not follow up with you, anything that is a resource that you want them to, 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 to take away. And I can put that in the show notes as well. well so this, the stage uh, is set. Shout Outs and Plugs. All right. So my uh, Instagram account, um, that's in the desert, in the city. That's my moniker on Instagram. That's where I place, uh, it's mostly just ponderings, usually a picture that will evoke something. I will write some kind of commentary. Uh, A a really great uh, thing to be looking at online right now is something called the New Yorican Poets Cafe. New Yorkans are Puerto Ricans who live in New York City. And this started back in uh, late 1960s, early 1970s. And it's a sort of a live performance venue, but because of the COVID, they're doing all their presentations for free online. I highly recommend this. I sat through one a couple of nights ago uh, that was African-American women expressing what is it like to be living in the present moment through their poetry. I was literally sobbing for like two hours after that was over. Absolutely great uh, cultural way to think about other people's experiences. It's people who are professional poets, but also people who are just in the communities that they're involved in. Very, very interesting. Highly recommend that, yeah. New Rican Poets Cafe, really love it. And any shout outs, any people you want to show some love to, you know? Uh, oh, you know, that would be everybody. <laughs> I love it, everybody. Everybody, around, that's like an ODB thing. He's like, everybody, all people across the world. Like, <laughs> like I remember used to do that. You know? I all day long follow uh, this journalist who is named Yamish El Sindor. She works for PBS NewsHour. She is probably the single greatest living journalist in America at the moment. She's a White House correspondent, so she's at the receiving end of a lot of the crap from the president. Uh, I do not know what support system this woman has at home but how she puts up with what goes on as a White House correspondent and still is, she's got her pulse on everything going on in America at any given moment. So her Twitter feed, her Instagram feed are absolutely fantastic. So I highly recommend her. Her name again? Yamish Elsindor. All right, I'll put that in the show notes. Yeah, she's fantastic. Well, it's been a pleasure. Uh, Thank you so much, H, for joining me. Um, it's been great. Uh, I really appreciate everything that you've done. Uh, still, like I said, 
we can go a couple of years or whatever, but when you drop in, in my life, it's always significant and it's always some gems. You drop some gems and I really appreciate that. And like I said, I, I kind of sell the good word of studying history because of you. I don't know how you, you pivoted a lot of my experience, um, but that was really impactful. And, and I know that I'm saying it a lot, but that does, I say things because I, I definitely don't want to leave things unsaid. So I, I definitely want to say online uh, into your, you know, whatever that you've made a, a good impact on me in regards to what I think about and how I look at history. And I really appreciate that. I very much appreciate you in a lot of ways. I appreciate your positivity and I appreciate that you have the job that you have where you're interacting with such a broad variety of people at a university that appreciates you. That's a very big deal. I appreciate the dad that you are because those boys are going to end up being very, very well prepared for the world outside of your home. There's no doubt in my mind. I appreciate it. Well, thank you so much. Uh, listeners, uh, if you enjoyed this episode, please share with your family and friends. Uh, it's at Positive Filter on all platforms. Or if you want to leave a voicemail, it's 571-336-6560. 571-336-6560. Sharing positivity is something we all can do and really stay connected and also be safe. Thank you for listening to Positive Filter, a podcast that focuses on family, friends, career with a little self-help along the way. If you enjoyed this podcast, please share it with your family and friends and like the Facebook page, Spreading Positivity of Movement. Thanks for listening.